everyone. I'm Annette Cone Skelton. I'm the director, and I'm delighted that you're here. For many years, Diane was a professor at Emory University, where she uh, taught sculpture, ceramic sculpture, for many years. She's been a practicing artist for 30 years. Can you believe that? 30 years. <laughs> Plus. <laughs> And she's had major exhibitions during those 30 years. She had 22 solo exhibitions, including this one, 50 plus group exhibitions, and she has received numerous grants, awards, and public commissions. In addition, her work is held in numerous private collections and museums, including Mother GA. She's created public art, works in the United States and Bosnia, and has traveled extensively to such places as Mali, Turkey, Indonesia, Peru, and Nepal. Her travels to Asia, especially Burma and India, allow her to pursue one of her research interests, observing and building pottery techniques that exist in the rural villages. She was awarded a Fulbright Research Scholarship grant to pursue this research in India and created several friends, films based on that research. She participated in ceramic studio residencies in Hungary, France, India, and Denmark. I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, in preparing for the show, and of course it took a couple of years, it was supposed to be, this is probably the third location of it within this building. And, um, and a couple of years until it actually happened. So that had its benefits as well as its uh, tedium thought processes that went along with that. Um, I decided to do a mini retrospective because I had been working for a long time and this was a really good opportunity to look at my work in terms of the things that I've done and the things that I'm doing and what I hope to continue doing. So I started with um, these pieces here, which some of you have probably seen in the Queen of Park, where I was commissioned by the Olympic in 96 to do them out of bronze and they are in the freedom park and they've got that sort of water coming out and coming into the molders. I originally did I think five of them in my studio as a trial and this was sort of part of it and then did that piece um, for the Olympics and then uh, because of the political situation it had to move and this really good place in Freedom Park to move to. Um, the piece behind you over here, I had um, the last two years that I taught at Emory, I had the great fortune to, to talk with a, uh, to teach with a um, uh, environmental biologist. And so my work totally changed. It went from figurative stuff semi-figurative things to um, these sort of cells and microbes and um, molecules. She would present a slide in one day and then my students and I would go into the studio and then we would make pieces. So out of that came a whole other body of work. And I have continued making these I call them cells, but I do spend hours making little, all those marks on the cells are all done by just taking a little tool and making little marks in it. It's almost a meditation for me, and it's a way that I can sort of think about things while I'm doing it and see what would be the next. Um, and the black ones? ones? The black ones? The black one? Why not? <laughs> 
I come from a school uh, met, uh, um, that says, why not? I come from a school that says, what if? So both in my own work and in my teaching, I always said, what if? What if I take a piece and turn it upside down? What if I put two pieces together that don't belong together at all and see where they will go? So, um, so the black ones are, why not? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and the one in the middle is part of this whole series of um, the microbes and my interpretation of microbes. The um, the piece the pieces behind you, these figures here. When I um, I had to move my studio. And I found a studio over in Avondale which had really a lot of space. And it meant me starting all over again. Mm -hmm. And as a, most of you are, most of you are artists, a good number of you are artists, and you know that difficulty of, and excitement, it's, it's both sides of the coin, of what happens in a new space. Do you continue what you've been doing? Do you start something new? Do you take advantage of this whole excitement of the new area? And so I, um, I didn't know where to start, so I started with figures. I, I, made, I made a big figure, I made a medium-sized figure, and then I started to make these figures. And we'll come back to those because they get more complicated, but it was a place for me to start that was somewhat familiar for me and not something that would take me, I wasn't ready to go into domains of the unknown. Yeah. Um, though the heads is where I ended up going in this space, is that those very strange forms um, became a why not put them on top of the figures. It was one of those why nots. Why, why not take all these very strange things that I'm doing, which could be related to the virus, could not be related to the virus, it doesn't really matter. But it was a why not, why not put these on top of this figure? And then it just sort of grew from there into the hands. And I, those of you who know my work, I've done a lot with hands, um, hands holding things, and especially hands and seeds. So that this photograph here is a part of a triptych of the eyes are from an Indian man, and the hands are from an Indian woman, and the, the seeds, which I collected in India, just come down into these things that the woman is holding, which are called ears, uh, ready to collect them. It's interesting to look back at one's work and to make a decision of what would be appropriate for an exhibition like this when there are many possibilities. And um, so I chose to take these three figures, this one and this one, these two have lived in my garden for 13, 20 years. And uh, especially this one, which has been growing this fungus on it. And it's you didn't make this. I did not make the fungus. <laughs> you could. I could, yes, but I didn't do it. And it was part of a series called Forest of Our Dreams that I did five of them that were done when the clear cutting was happening in the United States, a lot in North Carolina especially. And I happened to be in Seattle when I would see these um, logs being shipped out to Japan to be made into plywood to become shipped back in here. And so I did this whole series called Forest of Our Dreams. And this one stayed with me. There's one that's in my house and the rest have sort of all gone different ways. I love the way that this one has turned its clay, and everything is clay, by the way, that, that it looks like stone, that something has happened to it so that the texture looks like it's been carved out of stone, and the way that the fungus grows right underneath the eyes is sort of really 
it's just great that it shows to do it there. I, you know, I just put it out on the table and it's been out there. This other one um, was part of the show. I had been to Burma and I had an exhibit at um, Emory in, in that fabulous gallery that they had. And when I went to Burma, it was very much about how gracious and wonderful these people were in Myanmar and how and yet how they were very inhibited. They could not really speak freely. Now of course it's all come up again after it being really eased off. But when we went it was um, they were really afraid of talking to you. They didn't know who would be the uh, undercover person standing next to you. So, um, so this piece is the, the bird, is the freedom, and the hand is sort of locked into the crooked cage. So, um, the piece, this piece is an interesting piece for me because it's, um, it's been revised. The photograph in the back was an actual piece that these other pieces were attached to. And when I chose to do it this time, I decided to make it a more dimensional piece and actually became very excited about it, that there's the photograph in the back and then the pieces that still remain are just attached to it in various places so that it wasn't a question of matching it up. It was just a question of where do I have room and where is it appropriate to put the pieces that I have left with it. So I only saw it flat and when it, uh, when we installed it here it was like this really aha moment in which I got really, oh my god, it works. <laughs> I got really, really excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then this whole section over here Um, these are my books and bundles, this whole installation. I have been uh, taken by bundles a lot because I spent a lot of time in India. I've gone to India every year for, since 2007. And the bundling that they do in India is you don't know what's going on, but you know that it's something is wrapped. And so I started to make them out of clay and realize that the excitement about them is we don't know what they're holding. So there's a whole mystery. I mean, here's a whole table of maybe 50, 60 bundles, and each one is a surprise, because you don't really know what is it holding. What's your word? Bungalow? Bundle. A bundle. Bundle, yeah. So the photographs, I went through my photographs and I, I dueled them. I got two, two photographs and turned some upside down so some can make you a little bit woozy if you look at them long enough. And they're not all from India. They are um, from different places. This is, this is from Hungary. This is actually from Piedmont Park. This is from Barry, Massachusetts. It's those worms and uh, caterpillars. And this is probably from Atlanta. Um, this is from the lab at Emory. Um, yeah. This is from a local uh, printer. So they're from all over, mainly from India, but so the bias square. What what was your reason to pair them like you did? Um, interest. Visual. It was a visual. Visual. Yeah. Yes, it was just a visual. It wasn't like this is from uh, Venice and this is from Hungary. It wasn't a question of joining them. It was just purely aesthetics. And I happened to have this paper, which I brought back from Jaipur. Um, I have 
sort of found this little paper making place in Jaipur, uh, the same as the paper over there, that, that makes this paper that is made out of hemp and banana. Mm -hmm. And this particular paper is done for the Morley painters in India. Those are painters who make these sort of very intricate kind of designs. And I was in Bhopal and I thought I would meet some more the painters, so I brought with me 50 sheets of paper, and I only met one. <laughs> so, so I had all this paper, and I needed more paper. They sent it to me. So just by chance, that what if, I put the photographs on top of the paper, and I thought, yes, they're just, they're just perfect. So um, they are glued on. They're glued on to the paper. Yeah. And then um, there's the creation of the print. You have to dip over this if I don't understand. <laughs> Sorry. Is the one of the work in each photograph is in the creation of the print itself as much as the photograph? In other words, you, even those there, you're sort of manipulating the printing process. Right. To right. Create the right. 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 Because I. I took the photographs, for instance, this one, which was probably, I think it came from Alexandria, Virginia, I think in the market, and it was a bouquet that went like this, right? And um, that's true of this one. I mean, on all of them, they've all been manipulated somewhere. I think I was thinking more of those, but... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to this. So, um, there's been a question about the books. Uh, the whole thing, uh, the whole piece, is sort of a conglomeration of all the new, because the table itself, I looked for months for a library table. I looked for a library table would be perfect. Couldn't find it. And one day I looked at this old table that I had that I used for a wedging board. And I thought, it's perfect. And then the top part, in order to make it bigger and higher, that this wood came from my basement, in which wood was stored that was at one time a um, bookcase, right? So all that came together. And then I couldn't quite decide how to put it out. <coughs> and then I realized I had a slate that I've been collecting you know, God knows for how long somebody had done a slave move and I ended up getting this slave and I just thought it was just perfect. So I've written poems. They're not my poems, they're all famous poems. But they're all been handwritten with um, pastel pencil. Um, it's Mary Oliver, it's Mark Strand, it's uh, Neruda, it's T.S. Eliot. It's just several poems that I wasn't so interested in you reading, but just wanting to know that it was part of the, of the literature of it. So the books, the books are not really books. They're books, they're books that are written as an extreme of consciousness. I just, I'm not interested in you reading what I've written, but I will just write and then finish the sentence off in space somehow and then come back to it. And I realized that it's not so much about the words, but it's more the calligraphy of it. So having spent time in India where a lot of the um, Arabic writing is done, say, on, on the walls, I just fell in love with it. And so this writing is words, but they're not really meant as words. They're more meant, meant as a calligraphy on a piece of clay. And clay is very receptive to being touched and poked and written on. The bundles on the clay, and all these bundles, all contain something. So it will depend on where I am when I make the bundle. So these, for instance, I made when I was in India, and I would just find an old rock. So they could be rock, they could be dirt, um, leaves are wrapped up as a hidden thing inside. 
And the paper is all handmade paper that I bought uh, mainly in India. The uh, thread is very interesting because the thread comes from my Aunt Esther. My Aunt Esther, besides having the best chopped liver in the world, <laughs> um, and was definitely the aunt that would bring you the red sweater and wonder where the blue one was. But she, uh, when she died, I got all her threads, and she was a seamstress. So all, a lot of these threads are old threads that come from those old little things, those little bobbins. So it's sort of a conglomeration of um, lots of images that I have of words, calligraphy, bundles, and I know. The, uh, this piece here is sort of for me like the ultimate of all my pieces together because the bundles, the bundles are all again from India, I made the bundles in India. So everything that's stuck in there is something to do with my residency. And here it's on hand, and as a lot of you know, I've done most, this is the first show that I don't really have a wall of hands happening. So, and then the leaves is what will lead me to these pieces. And the leaves dipped in um, porcelain slip. And what happened, and what, where all these photographs came from, was the idea that is there a way that I could use clay and the photographic process and do the two together? And so I began to very simply, these were the first ones, um, I dipped the flowers in porcelain slip. And um, for those of you that don't know what porcelain slip is, it's clay that's sort of very wet. It's like buttermilk. And it's, uh, I did it on a plaster. So when the clay, the slip, hits the plaster, it absorbs the water right away. So it just stays there. So I got very excited about what all these little marks and things that would happen. So the next step was to take the clay and to dip it in just in plaster and just photograph it as such. Here, I dipped it in clay, I photographed it on, um, on top of something else, and then I wrapped the leaves in my journal and in um, a fabric. And that's true of a lot of them. In this one here, I photographed it on top of a table, which was a painter's table, so that all that color was just sort of excitingly left that there. This is actually in Hungary. This was this is a map of Hungary. So I took the image of the um, of the leaf and put the photograph behind it. Um, these papers are again from that place in India that I really love. I just the women just sit there and pull the hemp apart, and then the whole family is engaged in making. This one is a conglomeration of the leaves dipped in plaster, photographed, and then photographed again with the strings, and then photographed again with, I don't know, if some of you saw my show in, um, in Athens in the moon where I had made these figure, these small things called biotangles out of clay. And um, so I wanted to find a way that I could integrate it. And on and on. So these are all, these would be photographs of layering different photographs together. This is a, a sketch from my sketchbook, and this is a piece. Um, this is my journal in a leaf. Um, I bought a lot of kale. I bought uh, kale pieces in from Whole Foods, and I've had my studio is just sort of full of kale when it dries. Um, it's really very beautiful. So that's a kale. And then these, this is a photograph of India, and then manipulated so that I have my journal and pieces of broken clay on it. The same with the other one. 
And then the last piece I did was this piece here. And I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, um, when I made them, I made them at the same time that I was making those figures with the funny heads. And I kept them standing in my studio, uh, wet, for a long time. And I, there's something about the movement of them that is both growth, because I've also done a lot of trees and roots, but there's something about this sort of growth coming out, and then these root kind of things happening. And um, once again, in that process of working, this is not my original intent but it was putting some color on it and thinking, oh, I'm going to make it, you know, green or purple or something like that. And then, I, you know, stopping and going, but oh, wait a minute, why not? <laughs> so um, it's a why not piece. Right? And it's a piece that uh, I feel very, I feel very good about that piece, actually. I, I want to talk about my process a little bit because I think that's always an interesting thing to hear. Or just talk about the process. Um, when I was getting ready for the show, the process, and it turns out I had the same, there are no people who know me that can say, you say the same thing every time. It's like I can't do it because I have no ideas. And um, I'm going to call it and say, forget it. It's going to be, it's, I can't do it. Finished. And a week later, it's, um, well, I say the same thing every time, and, um, and I always say the same thing, but this time it's worse. This is the worst. This is really, I can't do it. This is, I swear, and then somebody say, but you said that last time. And so before I know it, I'm doing a little, I have a ritual I do in my studio, in which I sort of sketch a little bit. And, and before I know it, you know, something begins to happen something else begins to happen. And so those figures outside there, those three funny looking creatures, um, it was like, why not put the bundles in their hands? Why not tie it all together by, the figures are not separate, they're all part of the same, same thing. So the idea, I've used the word deciduous a lot, Somebody, I mean, we did a word exchange with somebody, and this person gave me the word deciduous. For five years, I've been working with the idea of deciduous. So all these are called deciduous. And then I was thinking today how that figure, the one with the lichen growing on it, is the ultimate in deciduous. I mean, it's really, it, it's going away in its own way that it goes away. and. Deciduous, not just in terms of evergreen and deciduous, but in terms of the deciduousness of our bodies. You know. um, so here, and the deciduous is happening right in front of my eyes. I mean, the, since it's, the piece has been in this gallery, it has changed color, it's gotten dark, and the uh, lichen is beginning to curl off because there's no moisture that it's used to. So, so it's just sort of a, um, it's another continuous sort of process for me. Anyway, I think that's all that I have to say. It's a lot. <laughs> May we ask questions? Yeah, please yeah. ask questions. But when you have to take off your mask because I can't understand you. <laughs> Let me give you a line. This piece in particular really strikes me in that you have bound packages, that which is bound, that which is not revealed, versus this very fluid other side of the coin, the text on the books, and you know the lyrical versus that which has not been revealed. It's a really interesting juxtaposition. And when you started speaking to these little bundles on top, and whether a um, consciously or not, wrapping certain things within these bundles, it really 
struck me that while you spoke of the process for this, it seemed like there was a richer ritual associated with your making. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could speak to this juxtaposition and the role of ritual in your art making. <laughs> I think for me, I don't know in the world, but just for me, um, making the bundles continues to be original. So I've, I've made the bundles up until I had to bring the stuff here. So the ritualistic making is what excites me. It's not, I'm not, I'm not a product-oriented artist. I am a experiential artist. I'm one who likes to work with the hands. I have very good eyes, I see well. Not so well, but, but, but well in the sense of visually okay. And um, so if I roll out the clay and I start to fold it, it's the folding and the mushing and the moving and the wrapping that interests me. It works, it doesn't work. It doesn't really matter to me. And I think, um, when, I, when I think that, when I say to people, you, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I don't take any risks. I'm just not a person who takes any risks. And they look at me like I'm nuts because. Um, How could you say that with what if and. Um, I know, so I, <laughs> but, a risk. You know, and then I look and I think, Looking at this, I think each one is a risk because it is. I, I, I have no. I'm not gain. I'm not out to gain something, right? So that's the part that's ritualistic. Mm -hmm. With the word engagement, I was thinking of the word engagement in the process. Right. <laughs> no, you just take off the mask. Oh. So I can hear you. Reveal my real self. <laughs> engagement. Engagement. Right. You are, there's something about you engaging with the material right. that right. seems to be part of what is so satisfying. Right. Well, it's like on those cells, when I spend hours going like this, that's engagement. Mm -hmm. And it, I think you saw my biotanicals there, but oh, those yes. things yeah, are yeah. just full of all those little things. There's something about doing that and that process that makes me feel alive. I mean, after all, we shed our bundles. At some point, we brought mm -hmm. our bundles mm -hmm. after having filled our bundles. Mm -hmm. So what comes to mind is a friend of mine's uh, mother just died. And um, they wrapped her. Mm -hmm. And in the Jewish tradition, you wrap in a you make a sort of a shell. But I hadn't made that connection. So I thank you for that. I, I don't really speculate what's inside the bundles. Um, and these bundles don't have anything inside them. Maybe one or two do that are not clay, but all the ones that are clay don't have anything inside except air, which of course in the firing process the air is But the bundles should also really come out the absence of people. In other words, right. these bundles have been somebody has relieved themselves of something and is no longer there. Right. Right. But there is still evidence of a presence that doesn't still exist. And I think that there's a nicer deciduous. Right. It's very, well, so. I have something to think about. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, it would be very interesting to um, do these bundles with the idea of deciduous, which would make them very different kind of bundles. Because right now, these bundles are bundles that hold things. But what would happen if they were bundles created from the idea of deciduous? 
in which they would have totally different form. They would, um, I don't know what they would be. I couldn't say what they would be. But it would be, it's an interesting idea. Thank you. Yeah. Can you plan your itinerary around some idea of what you want to accomplish when you get there? In, in my travels? Yes. Mm -hmm. No. I'm not a, I'm, I was going to say I'm not a planner, but I'm, that's probably not true. But I don't plan what I'm going to work on and uh -huh. what I'm going to do. So, for instance, in India, um, I, let's see, how did it start? It started with, uh, there was a ceremony and there were thousands of marigolds. You know, they make a lot of uh, marigolds necklaces. And uh, the great thing about the place where I go is that I could say, can I have all the marigolds? And so we just scoop them all. We just drop them in my backyard. So I found a old bird, I don't know what kind of bird it would be, but like a birdhouse. And I filled it all with the marigolds. And I started, it was sort of the start of the deciduous thing. I started taking photographs of what would happen. And then I saw these leaves. Um, it's these leaves, these long leaves. I don't, I don't think it's a Farsha Mar Mar Maria tree, but it, it's some tree. And I thought that is really perfect. So I put a cord across the back, and, the, and then I got close things, and I started to hang all the, the um, leaves. And it's right next door to what's a small clay studio. Mm -hmm. And there, when I took my walk, was this great big basin of uh, slip, mm -hmm. you know, mucky clay. And I thought, why not? <laughs> yeah. So, no, so I don't plan. It's just, yeah. just, what, 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 just whatever happens. Because you went to some unusual countries and not usual tourists, Hungary and Myanmar. So I just wondered what was the method to your what if madness? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'm, I'm off to Hungary, hopefully, fingers crossed, at the end of August, and I don't know what I'll be doing. Yeah. I mean, I might pick up something that I left off, I think I made this in Hungary, this piece here, which is my journal, and um, pieces of jute dipped in um, porcelain. And then I went down to the plaster studio, and this is glass that's full of plaster. Just put, so I might maybe I'll start there. I have no, I, I have no idea. So. Any more questions? Diane, you talk about your um, journals. Um, have you been a lifetime journal writer? No. I have journals that go back. I have a stack of journals that um, I kept religiously for a while, and then I stopped doing. And it's interesting because when I thought about talking about this piece, I thought, this is, my, this is a journal. And this journal on it, it says secrets. Mm -hmm. So my journals have always been very secretive kind of journals. Um, and just like this writing is sort of secretive writing. Mm -hmm. And if you know that some of those figures that I've done, where all the writing is on the back, that's all secretive writing. It's not that I'm making it secretive, it's just that I don't want you to read it, so if that's secretive, then it's secret. I'm not out to make a secret. But it, so, um, I find it more interesting to do it on clay than on paper. I used to carry a journal with me all the time, and then I really stopped doing it.
you feel a little can, a so, little bit like you're an anthropologist in these countries in, in terms of just observing their religious rites and their um, is there a way that you can you're kind of channeling that and seeing where that takes you and then on a very conscious level unconsciously so my studio in India and my studio in in Kashkamed in Hungary, it's the same. The wall is full of stuff that I find. <clears throat> like there'll be, I'll get a, a, those marigold things, put them on the wall. Um, a picture, I always have a picture of Ganesh, you know, the, the god of um, wisdom and remover of obstacles. I always have a picture. I always have a picture. I, I mean, just whatever. So it, it's not a conscious thing, but it happens. Yeah. See, I have a little bit of a feeling of being in an archaeological oh. museum, a culture that maybe was shared disingenuously or something, yeah. an ancient one. Oh, interesting. And especially the, the figures on the wall seem very shamanistic. Right. Well, I'm sort of drawn to that kind of imagery. Yeah. yeah. Diane, I really like um, what I see so much all around me here is you see the hand in all the work. Mm -hmm. Even these, even these works that you didn't do, that you photograph them, they're sewn up, uh, they're collected, they're stacked. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the clay pieces you see your hand in the work all the time. And I think that you're a very, very process oriented. Yes. And you are comfortable enough to get to a place where you trust that instinct. And you, you know, talking about your process, you don't know what you're gonna do until you get there. You may go back to something you've done before to get to get the process started, maybe if it's not kickstarting, you know. Um, I really enjoy that in your work, and I think the show is really beautiful. Thank you so much. So, um, Chester and I had a studio together in a basement. <clears throat> this is when you first started, when you came back from Penn. Yeah. In a basement on uh, Drew, uh, Drew, uh, Drew, uh, Dutch Valley Road. Dutch Valley Road. On Monroe, in the basement. Yeah. So. And I'm, I'm thinking I remember that table. <laughs> Did you, I think you had it. Could be. Yeah. I don't remember. I think you it could be. I, that's all I remember is I gave up smoking in that studio. Yes, you did. And that I was remember. very difficult. Wow. <laughs> just, yeah. But thank you. Yes, I. Um, the photograph is not the hand, but it's the eye. And it's the hand that manipulates the photograph. So. So the question is, where, what's next? You know, which is a terrible question because I've been to my studio and it's like I move something, a chair from here to here and think, oh God, I'm leaving. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just really hard to start again. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the idea of the photographs and the clay is something that, there's something there in that I'm not a photographer I'm, a, I'm an artist that's using photographs and clay, and how can I, how can I find a way to work them together in a way that I find, that I find, I don't really care what you find, but what I find sort of sparks something, and I go, oh, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So it's the same thing in, in this idea that, because this piece, had a different form two times before. And all of a sudden, I just had this idea to take a photograph of what it was. And so you end up, I end up getting more of a dimensionality than it had originally. And who knows what's going to happen, though hopefully somebody would buy it. But hopefully, you know, where would the next, where would, or is it finished? I mean, we don't know when we're done. And, and actually, that's a good example of uh, this, the round forms, the sort of, I call them, I call them um, cells, but they're not really cells. 
but it was in Hungary that they had these really wonderful doilies. And one day I went and I collected all these doilies, and I put one on top, and I thought, oh, why not? And so in the original application of this piece, it was actually those round things on the real doilies. But the imagery comes from working with the with the scientists and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Diane, what camera do you use? <laughs> what, mm -hmm. what camera do you use? Uh, well, a Sony six thousand mirrorless camera and my iPhone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't you don't have a big format camera? No. Mm -hmm. One day I'll take a course in photography. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of um, where to go from here, this piece, or some variations of this piece, has had two names. One is New Beginnings, and the other one is New Endings. So that's what I really want to end with, is that I don't know whether it's a new beginning or a new ending. Thank you.